Season four of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, Polar Inertia, a journal of nomadic and popular culture online at polarinertia.com, and by Press Up, friendly web consultants who listen to your goals and provide solutions that make sense. Online at pressupinc.com. I'm thinking back to the first subject that I ever read you write about, and it's one relevant to the sort of greater area we're, we're sitting in. Not Studio City, but Los Angeles. How long has it been since you've thought of or looked hard at a uh, dingbat apartment? Oh, wow. Um, I uh, have not, like, intentionally gone out to look for them, but when I drive through a, a neighborhood that I haven't been, then I'm kind of scanning because I, I love the look. So... I don't. I don't go intentionally searching for them like I used to, but it's just kind of a, a, a happy surprise when I do go by them. Is anybody modifying them now in a way that fascinates you? I feel like it's time may have come to be the uh, the the era of modified dingbats might be here. I think so. I think that um, places like Palm Springs have kind of celebrated them and turned them into hotels, and they kind of they kind of get it. I don't think. L.A. so much, hmm. the, but that, that I think it is ripe for that. Right. Certain movements can be slow to catch on here. By the way, we're sitting in Los Angeles, the greater Los Angeles studio city specifically today on Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall talking today with a favorite guest from the era of this show's predecessor, the Marketplace of Ideas. It's Mark Frauenfelder. He is always of many things, but you'll know him best as... Probably the founder of Boing Boing, which is a site you've certainly seen, which began as a zine and is now one of the most popular blogs on the entire Internet. He's also the founding editor-in-chief of Make Magazine. And he was talking last time on the show that preceded the show, the show's predecessor, the show of which this one is the new iteration, about his book Made by Hand. And he has a new book out called Maker Dad, Lunchbox Guitars, Anti-Gravity Jars, and 22 other incredib- incredibly cool father-daughter DIY projects. You have daughters, but is there any other reason to to write a book specifically about father daughter projects? Uh, not really. Um, the The reason that I, I wrote a book about father daughter projects is because I have daughters, and so I knew that these were projects that would work for a dad daughter combination because they were ones that we were both interested in. And kind of the way that I determined whether something would go in the book or not is if we were both excited about doing it, then it would go in. If one if either I was bored or my daughter wasn't interesting, interested in it, then we wouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And so I just wanted to really be upfront about it and say, you know, these are projects that work for dads and daughters, or at least specifically my my daughters and I. This idea of who's interested in, in it is one that I've been thinking about a lot in regard to makers and making lately, because on some there was another interview I heard you do a few years ago where you were saying, you were talking about how for making so many boundaries have fallen. You can make all kinds of things. The only barrier still up is who is interested in it. The, the, the sense of something being worth doing because people are interested in it. I mean, how much, how, how at the forefront of your mind is that when you're thinking about making? Um, well, I think the, the, you know, the main thing is that I, I uh, have to be interested in right. what, what I'm doing. One, yeah. yeah. And so for me, if, if, if other people are interested in it, that's like a great side benefit and reason for me to think that it's something that could be a sustainable um, activity for me to do, maybe, you know, as, as a way to, to supplement my, my income because I have a lot of different income streams. So but something that, I, that I'm really fascinated per- personally. Hopefully there are other people who are too. Um, like, for, for example, something that my, one of my daughters and I, I have really been getting interested in card tricks. Mm-hmm. And one of the things we've learned is that there are – uh, different kinds of uh, ways you can modify card decks, change them, you know, cut them, glue them, switch them around, um, mark them, uh, paint them with invisible paints and things like that. And so I started uh, like searching online and getting books and figuring out all different ways to make these trick decks. And so I eventually thought it would be fun to do a book. So I'm, that's what I'm doing right now is I'm working on a book of how to manipulate card decks. And I think they're probably... I haven't really seen a book that's just devoted to making trick decks. Right. It seems like it's there's a kind of old school appeal to it as well. I mean, was that part of the appeal for your daughter? Like, it's this is just kind of a 
it's from another era and so it can be mine. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I I think that's a a big part of it is that there's a a rich history and they mostly started with uh, card cheats Mm -hmm. in in gambling and then magicians saw the value of them in tricks. And and so my daughter has been having a lot of fun uh, putting them together. And then again, it's one of those things that if you make your own magic props, you understand how they work really intimately because you're the one who made them. So I think you probably have a better chance of of succeeding with them too. Now, writing maker dad, what did you learn about what kind of projects simultaneously interest a fellow like you and, you know, a preteen girl as well? That seems like a very, it would be a very small part of the Venn diagram, but maybe not. No, I think, um, there, there are a lot of things in there that we both enjoy. So my, my, my daughter really likes video games and I really became interested in this programming environment that developed for kids called Scratch. Yes, which is, I'm reading about it in the book, I was like, if only I had that as a kid. I had similar things, but they were not seemingly as cool. Yeah, this is great. I mean, um, it, it's a combination of, I think, the basic programming language, which I grew up learning, which I think mm-hmm. is such a, a, a great language. I mean, I even used that when I was an engineer to design uh, programs for, for uh data logging for test equipment and things like that. And then also kind of, it reminds me a little of hypercard stacks too. Yes. And, and hypercard <laughs> was a powerful thing. <laughs> Basic was a, a, such a fun introduction to programming for me. It's something that continued. I, I don't really see programming languages being that that interesting, uh, have as many possibilities for kids, but something like Scratch is great. And then I think also like Python is is pretty close to being a fun starter language for kids mm. too. It is interesting to think about what, not just what appeals to kids in this context, but what projects keep them going, What on what projects can they run on their own steam, if you know what I mean, because it makes you think back to your own childhood, right? And we all have a lot of projects we abandoned as kids, and we wonder, why didn't I finish that and that and that? What, what have you learned about, what are, what's the kind of project a kid can keep going on? That's that's a really good question. Um, I, I kind of like to... to talk a little bit about what you said about how kids will sometimes abandon something. Sometimes is putting it mildly in yeah. my case, but and mine too. I mean, um, my dad was, and still is like a, a maker of things and he is an electrical engineer and he did a lot of elec- really cool electronics projects, Heath kits, um, and, uh, uh, making all sorts of great gadgets. And so I was interested as a kid and then I just kind of dropped it. But that was, I think it's, it's latent. It was inside and kind of just incubating over the years and, and decades. And then once I became interested in it again, I think that that foundation helped. And so I think all these things that kids get interested in and then maybe abandon for a while, right. it's waiting for them to pick up again when they, yeah. they have a newfound appreciation. I think like that's that, really satisfying, right? When you realize this is, I liked this as a kid and I'm back, you know. Yeah, someone being able to say that I did this at 10 and at 50, I, I found a through line. That's really cool. I think it really is. And I think like, for example, magic tricks is an example. I was really interested in it, in it until I was like 13 or so. And then I just dropped it. Now I'm <laughs> into when it. girls come into the picture, right? Exactly. <laughs> Card tricks don't survive. Yeah. Um, but now it's like back in my life and it's like, it's even though it was a long period where I hadn't been doing it, I, I feel like that connection to having that interest. And I, and I still have that kind of sense of excitement I had when I was younger. So I think kids, it's great for them to explore things. I don't mind it when my kids stop being interested in something. I think right. that's okay. Um, in fact, if they were just became obsessed with one thing, I think that would... They wouldn't learn anything else. Yeah, <laughs> that wouldn't be as good. I'd rather have yeah. them like, learn a lot of things. And that is part of the maker right. culture is... Makers, as opposed to like a hobbyist or a, right. an enthusiast, they're really interested in the whole world around them and how everything works, and they want to dabble and understand it a little bit. And it's okay if they let go of something and move on to something else. This this greater Los Angeles area we're in, how is it? What kind of a place for makers is this? Is it is it a good part of the world for makers? I think it's okay. I'm a little disappointed that it's not as uh, the, the the making scene is not as vibrant as it is in a place like San Francisco or the Bay Area. Mm. There are only a couple of maker spaces here. You know, one So what's a maker space for those who don't oh, know? Sure. A maker space is kind of like a uh, it's like a club. People pay a monthly fee. It's typically between like thirty and a hundred dollars a month. Yeah. 
they rent a space, typically like a store that's gone out of business. They load it up with, with 3D printers and laser cutters and uh, making equipment. And it's a place for they to hang out. And like really, the, the best thing about it is that you have other makers in there that are, you know, you're sharing ideas with. It's, it's a, it, so much happens when you have that kind of high bandwidth of an unmediated experience of like communicating with someone right there with you, right. showing you, oh, you know, you're not really doing that soldering thing right. Let me show you. And um, so they have them all over. And San Francisco has a lot of them, a lot of other, I think, you know, places that are more densely urban packed, you know, New York, and they have lots of maker spaces. LA does, has one pretty good one. It was a great one actually called Crash Space, but it's in uh, Culver City, which is right. kind of kind of a long haul for people who live in the valley. That's true. It's, it always depends on where you are because the area is so big. But I was thinking about the maker heritage, if we could call it that in Los Angeles or what that would be. Because I was reading Tom Wolfe's piece, the sort of, uh, the title is going to escape, like, like the electric candy tangerine flake, what have you. It's about hot rotting. It's about hot rotting. Yeah, yeah well, you know what it is. Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, uh, the, the uh, tangerine flake. Something, something tangerine flake. Electric something streamlined baby. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Yes. Oh, I was thinking electric Kool Aid. That's the yeah, electric. Different yeah, different one. Those are easy to confuse. Yeah. But in any case, it was about hot riding and the car customization, especially of the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. And because of the size of Los Angeles, it's like, well, if I'm going to get around here in a car, uh, then I might as well. A lot of these young kids said back then, I might as well learn how to essentially customize or build cars. Or it seems like people's were really, you know, wrist deep in this stuff. If they were young. In Southern California, in the 40s and 50s, they were makers, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, th that was uh, part of the part of the lifestyle then, and taking cars that were, you know, they could pick up inexpensively, cars that were, you know, 10 or 15 years old, and seeing what they could do with them, and adding, you know, surplus material from the from the war, adding it onto them. Um, or taking like uh, tank bellies from from airplanes and turning them into cars. That was like a, a really cool thing to do. Right. It's, that's, so that's not so common anymore, though. I feel like that's become so specialist. If you work on cars, that's like your one thing in life, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I do know some people though that that do cars and a lot of other things I too. See. So there are makers still who reach into the area of cars. It feels like cars got less cool somehow, and so like they're, they're not. It's not the coolest thing to be a maker about, right? These days. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that there's a pretty cool uh, hot rod culture, right. and you see a little bit of that at maker fairs and things like that. And I know some people who what are, do they look like these days? The hot rods of 2014. Uh, actually, I think a lot of them are interested in the same ones. You know, the, the prize ones they have are cars that were made from the 30s oh, wow. through the, the 50s. If you still go the same to, ones. Yeah, exactly. It's still the same ones. And, you know, up into the 60s. Um, have you been to Bob's Big Boy in Burbank course, on a Friday? Of course, yes. Well, yeah. a Friday, yeah, not recently, but I've, mm -hmm. I've seen that spectacle. What goes on there? Yeah, so that's where people bring their, their custom cars that they have finished lovingly right. and, and uh, turned into hot rods. Mm -hmm. It's great. So the scene is, I mean, it's great to see that, that that kind of L.A. hot rod scene has not, gone away and that there are people who are still carrying the torch. But it is interesting. I think one the reason you don't see a lot of modern cars being modified is because they're just harder to, to <laughs> yes, change. Right. You know, it's like a uh, black box. Yeah. Like Matthew Crawford said in his book, Shop Craft, Shop Class of Soul Craft. Oh, yeah. When you open the hood of a new car, all you see under it is another hood. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's aptly put. I mean, there is that conversion, but there's also... I think of another industry that was here a while ago, you know, aerospace. And there seems to be this new private aerospace industry cropping up where the old one did. I mean, is there any maker relevance to the sort of whatever developments have gone on in private aerospace here? You, you hear these stories about what people are tinkering with as far as their own personal space travel in the South Bay. I mean, is this real stuff? Is there, are, is there making coming out of that? Yeah, I think so. In fact, some of the people at Crash Space worked uh, in, in Mojave in that kind of little really? uh, private space nexus. And um, the, the, the there's a spectrum of activities that people can in, can participate in with, related to like DIY space. You know, on the low end, it's taking a, a balloon and and putting it into you know near near Earth uh, near orbital elevations and and using 
GPS and cameras and you can recover it. And, and, uh, and then to the point where for, I think it's like now around $10,000, you can actually launch a small satellite into space by buying payload space on a, on a, on a rocket, on a private rocket. And you can put your own satellite in there for under $10,000. You have to buy the space in orbit or just, you just, it's the wild west up there still. Yeah, I guess so. Hmm. Yeah. Um, there's probably regulations. Right. No doubt. But no doubt. <laughs> it's difficult to enforce sometimes, yeah. I would think, up there. Now, you have a long history with Los Angeles, yes? I mean, even back beyond the sort of late 90s article about dingbats, uh, mm. how far back do you go with this sort of part of the world? Uh, yeah, I uh, have been here since around, I think, 87 or so. Uh, after my, I, I worked as an engineer in Northern California, then my wife and I spent about five or six months in Japan. We came back and we uh, started living in Los Angeles. Um, and we're here until I uh, got a job. Oh, no, then I went to Colorado for a couple of years, back to L.A. It's been crazy. And then, uh, uh, and then from L.A., I got a job at Wired as an editor there. And so I lived in San Francisco for a couple of years, and then in 95, moved back to L.A. And basically, since then, we have not gone to many other places for more than, you know, a few months. Right. And of course, we talked about the last time, the sojourn on the South Pacific Island, which uh, for those who haven't read that pre previous book ma uh, made by hand, what was the motivation for that? Uh, yeah, we just wanted to uh, experience what it was like to live on a, a small island and try to <laughs> like live a, a simpler life. Right, right. And it was it was simpler in a lot of ways. But you can only stand that kind of simplicity so long, I take it. Yeah, and also um, things like the, the health care right. issues that we dealt with. With like One of my daughters was only two, like mm. two and a half months old, and she got pneumonia. And we had ringworm and lice and mm. toenail fungus and bronchitis, yes. all that kind of stuff. And then just you know, the fact that we were living on this island and the, the, the permanent residents there, the people who were living there, were were really nice and friendly, but they knew that we would eventually leave. So they didn't want to, and I don't blame them, they didn't want to invest the time, you know, what it would take to become friends with us. Because if we're going to leave, why, why do that? So, right. you know, our, our plan was to stay there a year, and I think we lasted like shy of, just shy of five months. For all the inconveniences of Los Angeles, at least it's more convenient than the South Pacific, I suppose, and in those respects. But I hear that thing you say about the people living living on the island not really wanting to get too close, knowing you'd go away. I feel like in Los Angeles, there's just this assumption people are going to be coming and going. So some to some, that means that no one ever gets close to each other. Mm -hmm. But to others, it's the reverse. Like it's everybody's, some experience it as people are less open because of it. Some experience it as people are more open because of it. I mean, do you, do you still, I mean, you do have roots here now. Do you feel like Los Angeles has that, transitory element and that it has much of an effect? I kind of feel like from my experience of living in different places, at least maybe the people that I know, there is a lot of moving around. And so you just kind of get used to it. But, uh, you know, I also stay in touch with a lot of people and have friend. I'm friendly with people who live in other places. Like one of my closest friends lives in, in San Francisco. And so I see him probably more frequently than I do a lot of people. Right, because every time you're up there, yeah. you hang out. Exactly. It's like, oh, we got to get together. You know, if, if he's down here, I'm up there. It's like, right. so it's interesting how that works. But, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, just like any other <clears throat> big city, um, people who work in the media or are artists or something, they do tend to want to move around because they're just right. curious about the world around them. So it's just something that you get used to and, and deal with. And you say a big city, but there's an intriguing element here for your type of making. I mean, where you're specifically living now and other places you've lived before in Los Angeles, you've been able to both technologically make and also kind of agriculturally make, right? I mean, it affords you the ability to, you know, grow stuff and to what, 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 does, what can you do because of that? Because of that semi-agricultural lifestyle people can sometimes have here. Yeah, well, I, and there's great opportunities for that. You know, you can have gardening, uh, keeping bees, keeping chickens, things like that, that are more challenging to do somewhere else. So that, that's a, like a wonderful opportunity because I think like having, t taking control over the food that you eat, you know, at least a, a little bit is, uh, 
something that it, there's a lot of bang for the buck when you do that. Like makers, I, I've said this before, like if you are making a robot or something, once you, the, like the building of the robot is really interesting, designing it, deciding what it's going to do. But then once you've built it, you kind of like, okay, here's this robot. I, I would just get, I would get bored quickly yes. doing that. But if you're making, you know, growing your own vegetables and raising animals and keeping bees, you are using the, those products every yeah. single day. And they're like, you know, multiple times a day. And, and it's like an, an intimate part of your life. So it's that's like all. Yeah, and it's a, that's that's a, such a rewarding activity, and you're touching, you know, your whole family, and you know, sometimes your friends and neighbors when you give them, you know, a jar of honey or something. That's like a cool thing to do. So I think food, Los, Los Angeles being able to let people do that kind of thing is like a, a great opportunity that people should take advantage of. The growing of food and such it, it gives people a sort of a clearer how to put it. They can think more clearly about food in general when they do that, and it seems like. When people can make now that people can make media of their own so easily today, they also think a little bit more clearly about media in general. I mean, one of the projects in Maker Dad is making a podcast. Indeed, we're making a podcast right now as we speak. But you know, you do the the Apt for Kids podcast podcast with uh, one of your daughters, and do you get the sense that people of any age making media allows them, as I just sort of guess, to uh, to consume media better just because they've had a hand in making it? Yeah, I think it absolutely does. And it makes them more media savvy and it makes them aware of, of when someone is like trying to uh, deceive them in the media. Um, you know, understanding how media is produced and the fact that you can edit things, um, how it's distributed. Understanding that I think is really helpful. Mm. And that, that's kind of like uh, the, the, the other thing we talked about a little earlier is if a kid is interested in, in something and then they abandon it, at least they understand that and they become more aware and observant of the world around them. So, you know, if they were were making furniture, like making their own chairs, and then they just gave up after one chair, at least after that, though, they'll kind of like look at chairs and, and um, at the very least appreciate that there are people out there who can make really good chairs, you know, and, right. and be more appreciative you know what of what they have. Yeah. Given that you've been involved in seemingly every stage of the sort of personal media revolution of the late 20th century and early 21st, I mean, what, what has been your learning curve for media? How, what, was, what, was your, what would you say your grasp of media was when you began all this, when Boing Boing was a zine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had no idea about, about anything at all other than just like looking at a magazine and trying to copy the parts of other magazines that I liked. It's always stage one. Boing, boing. Yeah. And, and, and so uh, I thought it was, a, it was a great learning experience um, to do that. And I think I, I learned a lot just by actually doing it as opposed to going to school and, and, and taking journalism courses, which would have definitely been helpful. But I think I learned a lot more quickly mm -hmm. about everything there is to, to run a magazine and be an editor. Right. Um, and, you know, you definitely, if you do it that way, you're going to make tons of mistakes because you don't get a lot of, of guidance. That distinction between learning in school and learning by mistakes uh, is something you've written about and spoken about before. I mean, there's there's a certain degree to which, depending on the type of student you, you are or were, uh, school can poison you a bit by not telling you you have to be perfect every time, but making you feel like you have to do it perfectly every time, right? Yeah, I think it can be. And the reason, one of the big reasons is because kids get grades in school and those grades are kind of like, if you get an A, that means you didn't make very many mistakes, you know, and if you get a C, you get a lot of mistakes. So people equate mistakes with, with, uh, with bad grades. And so that's kind of what, you know, that's sad, but that's like the training. That's what, the, that's the big lesson is don't make mistakes. Don't do things where there's a possibility that you will make a mistake. So right. stick with what you know, because then you won't make as many mistakes. Right? Yes. That's so limiting. Yes. It's sort of the, I remember having a bit of this myself as a kid, though other kids had it worse, is when certain adults will decide that you're, you know, a smart kid, quote unquote, then Ed, life becomes about protecting that reputation. So you really can't try anything new that you might make a mistake at because you could endanger your reputation as a smart kid. You know, you get locked down into this world of almost nothing, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. And and, and I agree with the, the latest advice that child psychologists and educational psychologists say that don't praise your child by saying, oh, you're so good, you're so smart. Instead, say, 
you're a really hard worker, right. you know, and then they want to show that they're, they're hard. They're, they study hard, they work hard, they mm. try things. And that's like the kind of feedback you can give them because if they, if they want to maintain that r reputation, then they're going to want to, you know, expand and, and go, go further. Hmm. Now, is, is, that, is that a sort of thing that's being adopted then in your, in your daughter's generation? Parents are snapping to that plan where it's less about you're good and smart than, yeah, you're really trying. Yeah, I think so. At least that, that's what we, I, I heard that advice said, uh, one of my daughter's schools, they have these speakers come in once in a while. And this was like, you know, seven or eight years ago. And when I heard that, a light bulb went off in my head and said, that makes a lot of sense. When you were growing up, what was the sort of parental trend to, to, was it don't praise your kids at all? Was it say you're smart? Was it, was it, what was going on? Yeah. Uh, well, I think, uh, it was, it was, you know, make sure that your grades are, are good, um, you get good grades. And, and, but also, bring home the A's. yes, <laughs> bring home the A's, but also my parents were really, uh, they really encouraged and supported the things that I like to do. Um, like draw comic books, make movies with my Super 8 camera. I like to make science fiction movies, uh, monster makeup, magic, uh, those kinds of things. They didn't mind that I was like very interested in those kinds of nice. things. But you had this range of things you wanted to try. They were like, have at it. Yeah, they were fine fine with it. As long as I kept up my grades, they really right. didn't care what I did. <laughs> it's funny. I read a lot of books about Los Angeles because professionally I have to do a lot of writing about Los Angeles and a lot of the a lot of the books from sort of the mid 20th century they really get fascinated by the fact that in Los Angeles from what they saw it doesn't care what you do you're allowed to do anything have at it no one really says you can't do anything even if you can do it uh, it's this freedom that having always grown up sort of on the west coast I feel like has always been around for at least all of my lifetime. But do you think that that freedom to do what you want here is still a distinctive thing? I think it is. Mm. And I hope it stays that way. Mm. I hope it stays that way. I think, I mean, the reason that LA is like that, I think it's just because we're like the, the, the edge of where everyone ended up who wanted to have that freedom to do something. Right. There was like a lot of room to get, you know, to try things out. The climate's great. The resources uh, are, are nice. And so this was like a place for people who wanted to experiment and try things and, and, uh, uh, explore, see how far they could go. And so we still see that. I just wonder, you know, in time, if it will be, uh, people who don't have that mindset, there will, there will be, there, there, there will be new, no new place for people right. to go if things start to, to get stifled here. Right. And how does that, how does what remains of that freedom sort of express itself to you versus places you've been, whether it's England or Japan or San Francisco or Colorado? I mean, what, what's, how does that, how do you feel that here? Yeah. Um, I think that, like you said, people will not, uh, ridicule you or try to hold you back for trying things that are, are pretty experimental. Yeah, that's compared small. to England. That's definitely yeah. a contrast. Yeah. And, and Japan too. Yeah. 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 You know, it. um, they're just more conservative in, in their ideas about what is uh, a reasonable thing to do and what is like, you know, foolish. Mm -hmm. And here it's okay to be foolish. Right. There's that. I mean, I feel like Japan makes some room for its eccentrics, but there's certainly a way to do things. And there's mm -hmm. a lot to admire in that. I mean, I think of the movie, you know, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, for example, mm -hmm. where there's this fellow in Tokyo who is dedicated only to sushi. And there's I feel like the temptation to be the the generalist maker is strong, and the temptation to obsessively be about one thing is equally strong, and these two pull from their opposite directions. Do you get that sense? A little bit, yeah. I, I loved that documentary. And um, I, I also think that, uh, you know, getting obsessed with something and making it your lifelong passion is is a great thing, too. I mean, I... I, in some way, am envious that someone can be remain interested in something that long. I, I tend to like lose interest in something after a couple of years. <laughs> you know, I'll get like really into it and then just drop it and move on to something else, right. which is okay and it's a fun way to see the world. But also, what he's doing is like he's achieved. You know, it's, it's high art what he's done, and right. that's great. Um, so I, I'm definitely not 
saying that that's not a, a absolutely valid path. It takes a certain amount of security, though. I mean, Jiro in his sushi bar is perfectly effective, is the paragon of effectiveness, but in any other environment, I mean, he's not going to do so well. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this sense, especially in America, I think, and it's something people have said before me, of course, that it's cool that there's this renaissance of people figuring out how to do things for themselves, uh, but there's also this impulse behind it, like, what if society falls apart and I need all these skills, right? I mean, that's sort of an, that's not, I wouldn't say it's a dark undercurrent. People joke about it, but it's like, there's kind of that, like, well, maybe I'll, maybe I really will need to know how to grow my own food pretty soon. I mean, what, what's going on there? Yeah, uh, well, I think that there, there is some of that. Um, I think a lot of makers aren't that much in, into that mindset as, you know, the, the prepper movement. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. There they are, um, the maker prepper divide is probably yeah. fairly wide, but there's a little bit of overlap. Yeah, I think there's probably a bit of overlap. Um, I kind of like the the uh, makers, uh, like a maker slash survivalist. I've heard of, <laughs> of the term thrivalist before. Thrival, I've never heard that. Thrivalist. Yeah. And it's like they are already kind of uh, introducing that way of life now and not like preparing for anything. But, you know, why not try to you know, not get off the grid as much as, you know, reduce the, the, um, uh, the inputs from the outside world right. as, uh, and, and, uh, doing it in a way that works with their, their current lifestyle or, or, um, you know, the, their current situation. Right. So if they, you know, can grow their own food to some degree or, uh, or, you know, have some kind of livestock that, that works for them, mm. um, and, and doing it in a way that's fun and that they enjoy it. And without thinking, you know, I'll be set when the zombie apocalypse <laughs> hits. Instead of yeah. just, instead it's like not preparing for anything, but just being, you know, in the here and now, like doing this because it's a rewarding way to live. Hmm. This idea of reducing the in input from the outside world, I tend to associate that with people who want to like not get addicted to the internet. Specifically, they always talk about like, maybe I'll sort of throttle down the amount I'm on the internet or the amount that the internet gets to me. It reminds me of, in a lot of the generations alive right now, you get that sense from people that they're like, well, this, the internet has maybe reached into too much of my life. So I've got to figure out a way to keep its tentacles at bay in certain parts or wall off sections of my life where there is no internet. You get to younger generations and from what I assume, the younger you are, the more you regard the internet not as a different alien thing, but just as a thing like anything else or a part of life. I'm 30 this year, so I'm sort of, what the, I'm the last generation to remember what it was like before the modern web. Mm -hmm. Your daughters probably don't, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Have you have you seen the book The End of Absence? Yeah, I've seen maybe the cover of that oh, book. Yeah. What is this he book? He talks about that. He, he's saying that people born before 1985 are the, the last generation really that uh were an adult at one at a point where the internet wasn't this pervasive thing right. where um we everyone now uh no longer has the, the the things that the the uh lack of internet provides you know like solitude mm -hmm. being able to you know to to, to be bored right. it's like a, a a good thing to do right. and so um how we're this this we're this kind of straddle generation, and we we should really kind of think about what this means for future generations, and and what can we tell them now to help them realize that um, there there is a different way to live, and and to 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 realize that they they should try to access that sometimes instead of just all being always on. Yeah, it's it's, it's, a, it's a, it fascinates me so much. I mean, like, what do your what do your daughters think the internet is? You know, like what? I feel like they would approach it completely differently than you or I would. You know, I, do they? I don't know. Yeah, I think they probably do. I mean, it's just it is just part of their their flow of life, and um, the same way that uh, you know the, the the sound of the radio was for for my parents and the TV being on right. uh, is for me and it's just like it doesn't like you said it doesn't seem like a foreign thing because you were born with it and it's just always been part of your life so it doesn't seem like alien technology and that's how it is for our kids so my 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 daughter jane is you know playing minecraft and has <laughs> skype going with her friends so that they can talk about the world that they're in and for her this is just like this is you know this is the real world for me
Why do why does somebody older sometimes look at that and think, "Oh, that's terrible. How that, how how can we have let our children get into this state where they have multiple windows open or what? You know, it's like this doing multiple electronic things really gets to people. I don't know why exactly. Do you have, yeah. have a sense of what's going on there? I think yeah. I think a big part of it is like you said that they just they they didn't grow up with that and so <laughs> that wasn't and, what i did <laughs> yeah that wasn't what they did yeah and so they so and and they're kind of like too set in their ways to be able to participate in that so they just think it's like not a good thing mm. um and i i also think that you know unregul unregulated access to the internet if, if, if jane um, my 11 year old was just constantly online nonstop. I don't think that is a good thing either. It mm. is important, I think, to to be disconnected for a while so that you can. That there's something that happens to your brain when when you're away from all of that. Mm. That is better. It's like you you your thinking slows down. You become more aware of the the world around you, and that can help you. Um, I, I think in in uh, mentally is better for your mental health. Mm. Now you mentioned having worked at Wired magazine and you had a presence in the sort of late 1980s, early 90s cyberpunk culture as, as it rose up. And it's, it's a culture that I've been revisiting a lot lately myself, whether in novels or films or, or really anything, because I feel like we kind of are living in the world that cyberpunk envisioned now. Like it's, I'm not saying we live in a William Gibson novel, but we sometimes might as well in some sense. I feel like it's, we're almost more Gibsonian now than William Gibson maybe wrote about. It's, how much of that, how, it seems so wild at the time, cyberpunk, this just purely imaginative envisioning of this technology that seemed like it would never happen. How, how much of a cyberpunk world do you think we're now in? I, I think we're, we're in it quite a bit. I mean, you know, the, 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 the fun aspects and the dystopian aspects, you know. The, how dystopian has it got? Uh, well, I think, think, you know, like the, the Eastern European hacking is mm, like... Yeah scary uh, government surveillance of everything that we do is is scary um just the way that everybody is now connected has has great aspects to it but then again it's like you know just, just staring at your phone all day <laughs> is like i i don't think it's necessarily a, a very healthy right. way to live but yeah it is very cyberpunk it's, inter it's interesting the cyberpunks definitely were were looking i mean the the whole thing about the cyberpunk movement is that they were looking at present trends so they were and they just kind of amplified it so they and they they looked at quite a few of the, the right trends you know right. we haven't really gotten to the brain implant part yet <laughs> yeah that's the one thing where it's the brain stuff we're really yeah. waiting on but i was watching speaking of brain stuff uh hollywood was never great at cyberpunk i feel like although Catherine Bigelow's Strange Days was, it's, I was rewatching it recently, doing a video essay on it, probably the best Hollywood cyberpunk movie around, and it was set here in Los Angeles. And I still, watching it, it's, it holds up because it, it, it was made in 95 and set in 99, so it wasn't like a mm -hmm. distant projection, but it was, it was very, not brain implant-ish oriented, but very much like the virtual reality experience of someone else's recorded brain impulses being transferable was its main thing. Mm -hmm. But it, it occurred to me that being set in Los Angeles, Los Angeles is almost, maybe Mexico City is a runner up, but it's one of the most cyberpunk places I've been. I mean, because cyberpunk was always so focused on contrasts, right? Like, Contrast between people, contrast between environment, contrast technologically, socially, everything was stark. And this is a place of stark contrast, right? Yeah. And I think that the, you know, Blade Runner, that's why that was so compelling. Yes. Maybe that's the best Hollywood cyberpunk movie. I don't know, but they're both pretty strong in Los yeah, Angeles. I, I remember uh, the, the comic book, but I haven't uh, seen the movie, I don't think. It's, it's, worth, it's worth checking out. I mean, it's, it's very much... It doesn't turn Hollywoodish till the very end, and that's more than you can say of a lot of movies from that from that era. But is, it's, you know, but you you lived in Japan also. I mean, it's, is there is it really true that some places just handle the future differently? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think some embrace it more. Uh, some uh, uh, reject it just because of tradition, and then some 
places just for economic reasons can't get into it. And, you know, going back to William Gibson, he said, the future's here. It's just not evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. right. That's like a, a perfect line. I think, you know, going to Europe, you see that people really are into the idea of, of maintaining tradition. So they're less, uh, they're, they're more reticent to accept new technology in places that have had a lot of upheaval, um, like Asia, they're, and they're, they're, they have more money than they did in, in past decades. They're more welcoming of it. It's interesting, though, how Japan like has, has both, the, right. the, the, the tradition and accepting high technology. It's one that, of those reasons it was so attra attractive to the cyberpunk novelist, right? Yeah, I think so, absolutely. Hmm. I get the sense that Los Angeles rewards those who often leave it for other places, if you know what I mean. If you're a traveler, you live in other places like you have, it's, it, it makes living in Los Angeles a richer experience. Those who never get outside of it seem to have a bad relationship with Los Angeles, right? Yeah, I think so. And it's just part of the thing where if you, if you grew up here and you've lived your whole life, you, you don't appreciate it as much as someone who comes from another place and sees how amazing it is. It's like I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, and then, um, there's been times when I haven't been back for a few years, and then when you go back, I say, wow, this is really beautiful here. I never Right, it's kind of on the Austin-Portland axis as well, right, for the sort of cool towns, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. It, it, Boulder is, is kind of like, yeah, that's perfect, an Austin or a Portland, a little smaller, but... Right. What's the, what do you think, I mean, you get to San Francisco often, what is, what is the relationship between those, <laughs> these two cities, San Francisco and Los Angeles? It seems like they couldn't be more different, yet they're in the same state, and... They have they have connections, but it's sort of hard to say what they are sometimes. Yeah, um, yeah, I, it's I, not a high speed rail connection. I'll tell you. Yeah, it's not. It's funny. I, I think there used to be more of kind of a rivalry mm -hmm. type of feeling, especially. But, but it was funny. It's like the the San Francisco people had a really anti LA it's attitude. One way rival. Yeah, and the Los Angeles people were just like, hi, yes. you know, like not even realizing <laughs> that, that San Francisco hated LA so much. Was it, so is this a rivalry that was going strong when you were living in San Francisco? Or? Um, yeah, I think so. There was even, I can't remember the, the artist's name, but he did a, like a series of really great paintings about a civil war between Los Angeles <laughs> and San Francisco. Yeah. yeah, they're really good, done in kind of a, a classic style. Um, but I think I've, I see that less and less. I think people are are sharing ideas, uh, but, you know, between San Francisco and Los Angeles more and more. Um, and I'm not sure why. That's ha well, here, here's one possibility is that Silicon Valley uh, creating new forms of media uh, needed content. And so Hollywood could provide that. So there's, there's much more communication between mm. the two groups and, and mixing, I think. Mm. Now, what do you... What do you make of the sense that San Francisco is getting more and more techy with time recently? San Francisco, yeah, I think I think it is because um, what's happening is Silicon Valley itself is kind of a boring place to live. <laughs> I've been there before. It's not that good. It's spread out. Um, it's kind of like L.A. in that it's spread out, but there's not not really much interesting happening there you took at the all. Things out of it. Yeah, if you took all the good stuff out of L.A., you'd have Silicon Valley. So. A lot of the younger people that work in in those areas, they want to live in a city. So they're coming into San Francisco, you know, and there's all sorts of problems associated with that. But, but you know, and those people are bringing the technology with them into San Francisco. So it's happening. So do you think, I, I really am fascinated by what San Francisco can become because I feel like it's labored under an old image of itself for a long time. And if it can break free of that, it's, you know, it'll be pretty fascinating. I don't know if it'll be the America's Hong Kong anytime soon, but it's, what do you, what do you hope it can become? Um, I would like to see it continue to be kind of a, a place where progressive ideas are hatched and then spread out to the rest of the world. Mm. Stuff like, uh, the the gay liberation movement of the early 70s really started there and and you know it's it's now spreading around the the, the world and i think that that 
you know, th that was a launching point for it. Um, so I, I hope that it, it continues to do that and, and is this place where – here, here's the, the thing, though, that San Francisco used to be an inexpensive place to live. So people from all over the country who were like, you know, had, had, uh, had new ideas and fresh perspectives on things and, and, and wanted to make a change – is a place that they could go and in a concentrated area and make things happen. And that's becoming less and less so. I mean, it's incredibly expensive to live there now. Mm. So maybe San Francisco is not going to be the place where that happens. Maybe Portland will. Right. That's still cheap there. But the there's a sense in which you want to keep an eye on where the sort of cradle of new ideas is then. Yeah, mm. I think so. Is it even in America? Wow. That's a that's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, no one knows, but it could be anywhere. Like, yeah. or is it even in, in a physical place? It's there's an interesting sense in which there was this prediction of geography becoming so much less important because of the internet, and in many ways it has. But then it became also more important to be in a city where people were like-minded. Somehow it's somehow the the internet has done what we expected it to do as far as making you able to live anywhere. But then it also made it more important to live in a place where it live in a place you could engage with on a physical level as well. Right? Yeah, definitely. That's why that's one of the things San Francisco has going for it. I think mm -hmm. that, that concentrated urban environment. Um, and like I said, like maker spaces, San Francisco has a lot of maker spaces and places where people can, can get together and do things creatively. Um, you know, the whole Burning Man thing it really is kind of based in San Francisco. And then for one weekend a year, they're, they're uh, in, uh, in Black Rock Desert. So Have you gone to that? No, I have never been to it. <laughs> Nor have I. I feel like there wouldn't be enough showering uh, for me. But really, it's, that's, you see some incredible making going on there, right? Yeah, you do. Um, and one reason that I haven't gone is that the thing that I'm really most interested in is the, the creation of these cool exhibits and stuff. And they bring them all to Maker Faire oh, now. So, and so all that stuff, stuff is there. I don't get the whole, uh, I don't get to participate in the whole tribal thing. Um, and I, I just, I think that's, that's fun. But for me, man, I, I'm, I'm too spoiled or something now to, to, live in a, a tent in, the, in yes. a dusty desert. I'd get an RV, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Do, what, do what Eric Schmidt does from Google. <laughs> what, he pulls a palace up. It's crazy, yeah. <laughs> but for some reason, I've not been there, and uh, and I don't know why I haven't, other than I just think that it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work to get out there, and I don't know if I would appreciate it that much. I'm not a huge fan of big crowds of, uh, of people, is one thing. Like, Maker Fair has gotten pretty big and crowded, too, and I uh, it, it gets to be kind of exhausting. Now, a lot, a lot of wild ideas come out of these spaces, and you know, a lot of cities produce advanced ideas like San Francisco does, but there's humbler ideas that can be fun to think about. For example, the idea for the popsicle, which you write about in Maker Dad, originally in what, 1905, an 11-year-old left some soda frozen, and I mean, it, it shows you that how much Maker history can you find like that? The sort of is there are there just these these very young accidental makers throughout civilization you can point to? I think so. Yeah, um, people. It's interesting how you can see how people come up with things that hadn't been thought of before. Like I was just reading about this guy who um, uh, water uh, water desalinating is is a is a big problem, you know, and, and so, um, it's expensive yeah. and you need to in, put a lot of in, energy into it. And solar, uh, desalinating is really inefficient. Mm. Um, and so this guy was just like messing around and he took like pencil shaving graphite, you know, just an expensive powdered up graphite and put it into some water or, and put it in a microwave until it turned into like this black sponge. <laughs> and it ended up being like this perfect way to, quickly absorb water and then when that when it and then it's because it's black and the sun's hitting it gets very hot and the little micro pores in it there's a lot of surface area to heat up the water and so it turns into steam really quickly even the the, the water itself at the bottom is pretty cool it's just as soon as it hits that part it gets really hot and so then um it's it turns turning out to be a potentially really efficient way to desalinate mm. water so like what a cool idea that there are problems with it of course the salt clogs it up 
And so you, you have that to deal with, but there, there, are, you know, there's some good potential there. So I, I mean, you see that kind of thing. Um, and then just the people who were, were makers who have come up with things that have turned out to be really great tools for other makers to use. That's one of the things that's really exciting to me is, is makers making tools and techniques and systems to do really cool stuff. Um, so like it, meta making. Yeah. It, and so if you think of like the things that a large corporation does to like, think of like uh, Panasonic or Sony or, or uh, a company like that, they have like a research and development team. They have uh, manufacturing uh, engineers. They have uh, a, a division that makes a prototyping, advertising, um, funding, marketing, uh, sales and distribution. If you look at all of those things, makers have created low cost or free DIY alternatives to all of those things wow. that are that are very effective. So you have crowdfunding. You uh, you know to, for financing your thing, you can go to Kickstarter or Indiegogo. I do on this podcast. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, if you want to prototype things, you now have three D printers and laser cutters and service bureaus that can do it for you. Um, uh, designing uh, is really so much more powerful now than it was when I started out as an engineer. The CAD system that we use costs like $50,000 and then you have to pay like every hour to use the, the software. Now you can download a copy of SketchUp for $0 and it's like 10,000 times as powerful. I still can't believe that every hour thing with a the dongle they checked yeah. on meter, like an electricity meter. Yeah, it was crazy. So all <laughs> the time you're like, of course, I'm using yeah. this hourly, you know, or yeah. paying hourly. <laughs> now it's just like, what? Paying at all, let alone paying hourly, seems a little weird for software. Isn't it amazing how things have changed? It's like, I mean, to think, so, so, so all these things, have, anyone now with a great idea and passion can, can bring this thing to market and, and see if, if the market responds. When before you had to really take a, you know, you had to be part of a huge organization and plug into that. And it was uh, tremendously expensive. It was very slow to get the projects to mar market, product to market, and now it's very quick. So um, that's really exciting. Um, and then there are things like uh, Arduino, which is an electronic prototyping platform that lets mm -hmm. Artists and, and designers add interactivity to their projects. It's twenty five dollars, and you can do really cool things with it. Um, there's a company called Little Bits, and they make electronic components that snap together mm -hmm. magnetically, and they're becoming more and more powerful. They've got a, a new uh, bit they call it. it's like a little square the size of a matchbook that allows you to communicate with the internet. So you could you know you could do things like hook it up to your garage door and um, open your door remotely from your cell phone or something or set up a program so that, you know, if your dog walker comes every day at 5.30, the garage door opens at 5.30 every day, but it also is checking the weather and it sees if it's raining, might as well not open the garage door because the dog walker's not going to come that day. You know, you can do... This is the Ray Bradbury house of the future kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Notable Angelino, Ray Bradbury. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good story. I love that story. I... I read that to my kids about a year ago. Oh, yes. That's a fun one to read out loud, I would imagine. Yeah. And the Velt is a good one, <laughs> yes, too. Yes, indeed. The desalinization question is interesting, especially in Los Angeles, because people are always wondering, where's the water coming from next, you know, in California in general. Mm -hmm. And we increasingly get the sense that, well, maybe people will make their way out of it, you know, with, with just the sheer amount of tinkering going on. It's hard not to get a solution for a wide variety of different problems. Maybe they're not all solvable that way, but many are. And I wonder, is, is that, I don't know, if it, it sounds like the next, before it, it, there was some idea that there's geniuses working in companies and the companies will figure out the solutions and that's fine. Then we sort of, said, well, maybe the companies won't do it. Now is it sort of like the, the, the force of, sort of decentralized making is sort of, it's a, it's a, it's a thing unto itself. We can we can count on at least some problems getting solved in that way, right? Yeah. Or it's all we have. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think there will be, it'll be a combination and it will also be a partnership between individual makers and maker spaces with uh, large corporations. And some of those partnerships will be formal and some will be very informal. Mm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's great having that kind of distributed, loosely connected group of, of, uh, 
of independent researchers and makers are going to be of, of tremendous importance in, in solving a lot of problems that we have. But finally, it does raise one problem this making is, is and it's a, a big problem. How do you decide, like, what scale of a problem is it to know what to write about on Boing Boing, what to highlight and make? There's got to be so much that just, I can't, it's, it's sort of giving me a headache to think of how you might even narrow that down. You know what I mean? It's tough. You know, I, you just have to kind of let go and realize that there's like this fire hose of amazing <laughs> stuff coming yes. at you. And if you just kind of reach your bucket out and, and fill it up with some, you're going, a lot of good stuff is going to pass you by. And right. so I, I just have learned to accept that fact and just kind of let it go. I know there's great books that, that I'm not going to be able to read, right. great TV shows, um, interesting things people are doing, um, artists and stuff. And, and, the what the thing that I really have to concentrate on is just making sure that the stuff that I do catch and want to redistribute to other people, you know, um, is stuff that that I really think is is good. Right. Make sure whatever you happen to be catching is indeed what's worth passing the word on about. But I wonder, with kids your daughter's generation when they grow up, it seems like they may just be better equipped to deal with the fire hose than we are, you know, the digital native thing. Do you think that has any, that idea has any worth to it that they may indeed be able to handle what we can't in that way? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Cause otherwise it could cause a lot of anxiety, right. you know, like thinking that you are constantly having to be on top of everything. Right. Reminds me of, reminds me of this pamphlet I saw. Maybe it was on Boing Boing actually. It was a while ago. A, a guide to telephone use from the 1920 or something like that. It was, it was an early, like, this is your first telephone, so here's how you use it. And one of the rules, rules, the guidelines was, don't let the phone ring more than three or four times before answering. Don't keep people waiting while it rings. They didn't realize people would be jumping on the phone. As soon as it, half a ring got out, they'd be grabbing because it was a novel technology. And in a way, that seems to me like always having to compulsively check the screen of your iPhone or whatever, you know, where something, it might be something neat or it's just a novelty. Maybe that sheer compulsion to, the compulsion to saturate yourself with that novelty will be less of a problem with somebody who's grown up with it, do you think? Yeah, it could be. Of course, there are other be. ones. Yeah. Well, I think also like my, my daughters, both of them really don't use email at all. I guess this is, this is a, they, I, I would guess, I was going to guess that they use Facebook, but they probably have something I've never heard about. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, they do, you know, Instagram, Snapchat and, uh, text messages. And that's kind of neat that, uh, they do that because in their email queue is not like always something that they have to like attack. I'm, I'm always saying 10,000 like, messages. Yeah. Oh, how many God. more emails do I need to go <laughs> to get to inbox zero? Yes. So, to not have that is like much right. better. Yeah, it's the main the main onerous force in a lot of lives of the parental generation. You know, it's like they just want to get done with their email, email, email. The kids figured out a way not to do that, which is yeah. don't deal with don't it in the first email. place. Never yeah, email. yeah, it seems impossible, but yeah. there we have it. And and somebody, I, I can't remember who defined email as an inbox that someone else has created for you. Oh, it yes. really is like every email, or almost every single one is like something that somebody wants you to do something for them. <laughs> In those terms, it's even more anxiety inducing, but not using email. That's something to learn from the kids. Mm -hmm. What's something else you've learned from your daughters or any, any kids who make in this, in the course of the maker dad project? I think one thing that they've taught me is that, um, the, the value of not sticking to the, the, the plans, uh, not, not, not thinking that you have to stick to the plans and that if you deviate from them, that it makes the, the experience worthless. Mm, I see. You can break from the framework yeah. and you can still think, get something yeah. out of it. Right. Mm. And, um, that there, there is still is value in doing that. Mm. Did this book break from the plan for it at all? Um, there were certain things. <clears throat> yeah. There were certain things that we did that, uh, that, you know, we thought, okay, let's, let's just try something else. Like the, the, uh, the video game yes. using scratch. Um, my original idea was to make it much more complex and stuff. And, and my daughter comes and saying, you know, this is just fun. Like let's, let's do it this way. And, and, uh, it, you know, she like kind of took over with the direction of it. And I think that was fine. Sometimes it's 
Le- you're letting things take their own course, but then handing the reins to the kids. Sometimes that's the best yeah. way, right? Yeah, and let them make a mess. Let them <laughs> spill paint. Let them, yeah, let them let them do it in their own way. And and, and so realize. Oh, here's the other thing. I, I realized that they could still have a great time with something, even if the end result looked uh, sloppier than I myself would have <laughs> sure. hoped it. You know, it's just the first iteration. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've been speaking here in Studio City with Mark Frauenfelder. He is the founder of Boing Boing. He is the founding editor-in-chief of Make Magazine. He is the author of the new book Maker Dad, Lunchbox Guitars, Anti-Gravity Jars, and 22 other incredibly cool father-daughter DIY projects. Mark, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Colin. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Special thanks to everyone who backed Season 4 on Kickstarter, including Joel Neville Anderson, Daniel Levin Becker, Paige Calvert, Commander Manvark, Jonathan Crow, John Cunningham, David Dawes, James DeVito, Tim Dobbs, Paul Doyle, Jake Elliott, Kevin Emmett, Lawrence English, Jonathan Filbert, Andrew Philippone Jr., Michael Fransky, John French, Themistoclus Eucrucius, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Samuel Hansen, David Hayes, Jeff Hilnbrand, Mark Hines, Andrew Johnstone, Tadeusz Andre Kudlubowski, Peter Kavanaugh, Ted Kane, Andy Cooney, Evan Landman, Alfred Lee, James Maloney, Sean McDonald, Alberto Bruzos Moro, Jason Miller, Rob Montz, Daniel Murphy, Richard Nash, Aidan Nullman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Ian Blosker, Christopher Porter, MJ Pritchett, Piers Rippey, Rob Schultz, Todd Shimoda, Cam Smith, Deborah Smith, Adam Sutherland, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Anna Traher, Thomas Interberger, Matt Warren, Nick Wagelt, Dion Wolf, Cynthia Yang, and Wayne Wright. 